Hi, welcome to Limnology. In this segment, we're going to discuss zooplankton. Zooplankton, or zooplankton if you're British, um, are amazing uh, animals that live in lakes and in oceans, in the open waters. And you might not think you're inherently interested in zooplankton, although they have amazing behaviors and are a key component of the food web. But the reasons that you might be interested in zooplankton, even if you don't think you are, are that zooplankton are really a key link between the phytoplankton, or primary producers in a lake, and the fish that you may be more inherently interested in. In addition, zooplankton are a really diverse group of organisms. They have many unique characteristics. They're often pretty easy to grow in the lab and to manipulate in experiments, and so they've been really key components of ecological studies and evolutionary studies. Um, and in addition, they have a lot of interesting behaviors, um, and the kind of zooplankton that we have in lakes makes a real difference to the operation of the food web in the lake. Some may be more easily captured by fish than others. Some may be more nutritionally um, good food for fish than others. And so for all those reasons, it's important to know a bit about zooplankton. Even though they're all small animals that can't swim against the current, um, they can swim. They do have behavior. And we're going to go through a bit of the diversity and some of the ecology of the basic groups of zooplankton today. So a few interesting tidbits about zooplankton to start out. Um, first, most zooplankton that we have in fresh waters are derived originally from marine groups, but there are a few that evolved in freshwater systems. So aquatic spiders and mites, the aquatic insects that we talked about in streams, um, as well as uh, the pulmonate gastropods, and one of the main three main groups of freshwater zooplankton, the rotifers, um, really diversified in freshwater systems, and Cladocera also diversified quite a bit in freshwaters. And another sort of cool fact that I don't think anyone knows the reason for is that there are no freshwater zooplankton that bioluminesce. So if you know anything about marine ecology, we have a lot of bioluminescent um, producing organisms in marine systems. Systems, and there are not uh, bioluminescent freshwater plankton, which is sort of too bad because that would be nice to see glowing lakes sometimes in the summer. So the first group that we're going to touch on we've already mentioned in the microbial section, and those are microzooplankton or very small zooplankton. And these are going to be uh, various protists, eukaryotic organisms that are heterotrophic, that eat their prey, they're not photosynthetic. And just as when we talked about the phytoplankton, we mentioned that they're extremely diverse. These protists are extremely diverse uh, for heterotrophic protists. And so this is a diagram of the tree of life just for the eukaryotes, excluding the true bacteria and the archaeobacteria. And you can see how distantly related things are. In fact, again, as we mentioned with the phytoplankton, um, all of the plants uh, that you know from land are in just this small group. All of the fungi are here, so all the mushrooms and so forth. And all of the animals, the multicellular animals that you know, are in this small group. So say my dog might be here, all the trees might be here. And all of these different groups actually contain photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic members and members that are uh, microzooplankton in lakes or in oceans. And we're not going to go into the detail of going through this new phylogeny for this course, but if you are interested in studying microzooplankton, you should realize how we're clumping our organisms into some sort of functional groups. So what do we mean by that? We're going to divide these so microzooplankton into groups based on how they make a living, on their modes of nutrition and locomotion. So we put the photosynthetic protists into the phytoplankton group, like our volvox there, and we're going to put the protozoans, or the heterotrophic protists, single-celled organisms, into a couple different categories as microzooplankton. And these are really not good phylogenetic groups, so they it contain organisms that are not closely related to each other. So the first is going to be the mastigophora or the flagellates. And again, these are going to come from a number of these different parts of the, of the tree of life. And then we're going to have ciliates, ciliophora, and then we're going to have pseudopods, the sarcodines. And there are uh, some other groups that used to be categorized, like the sporozoans and par parasites and so forth. And we're not really going to discuss those as microzooplankton. They would be more parasitic organisms that we've mentioned a few times. 
So these again are not good taxonomic categories, but they're useful if you're just trying to group the microzooplankton into some categories and think about them more ecologically. Uh, so these are flagellates, the mastigophora, um, and they can, the ones that we're interested in as zooplankton are predominantly colorless, although as we mentioned, a few of the ones that have pigments, photosynthetic pigments and photosynthesize, will also be consuming prey and acting as heterotrophs. And here are a few examples. They can be single-celled, uh, as you can see here, or they can be multicellular, forming a small colony. But there, again, there's no true division into tissues and so forth. Then we have amoeboid forms, and you may think of these amoeboid forms as living on surfaces, but there are some that live in the open water. Um, they're going to engulf prey with their pseudopods, these projections. And in freshwater systems, including the Great Lakes, there's some amoeboid forms that make a little hard case, uh, a, a test uh, that they make of sand grains. And it's sort of like a pelagic or open water caddis fly. And these uh, sand grains then are formed into a little container that protects the amoeboid form in the water. Um, and these guys are able to migrate vertically by regulating their lipid content. You may remember from the phytoplankton class that lipids are really light, they float. Um, and so they're able to manipulate the lipid content, become buoyant, go up and down in the water column, and float around in this protective sand case, consuming small prey items. And you'll often see blooms of these in the spring um, when they're also suspended by turbulence at the mixing time, as we mentioned earlier in class. And a different species of these diflugia, the speed one genus that does this quite a bit, make different shaped cases. And just like with the caddis flies in streams, you can identify them based on the shape of their case. Another kind of amoeboid form that we find in fresh waters are heliozoans that have much smaller um, axopodia that they use to catch prey. And then we have the ciliates that move by small cilia, cilia around the outside, and they use them as well to make a feeding current, like the paramecium, uh, that this clear colored cell that you would have learned about in intro bio. And this is a good slide to also talk about how the size of these microzooplankton overlaps with the size of phytoplankton. So here's part of a phytoplankton, a desmid cell, and this paramecium, this single-celled protozoan, is smaller than the single-celled algae. And we're even going to see some of the multicellular zooplankton that overlap in size with the phytoplankton. So that sometimes confuses people that you can have these primary producers being the same size as the things that are consuming other primary producers. Here are some other ciliates. They don't all look like paramecium. Some have uh, cilia that are in bands. Some are attached to surfaces. This guy is attached to a particle that's a lake snow, that's a detrital particle floating in the water. And they can swim slowly from site to site, even if they're attached. If they're on a small particle, their cilia generate a current. And if you follow the link uh, that's given in, on the Blackboard site, you'll be able to see a picture of this ciliate stentor uh, juggling an amoeba as it's trying to consume it. It's a pretty nice, uh, nice video. And here's another common ciliate that we find in fresh waters, didinium, with two layers of cilia. It's a nice electron micrograph. And so these microzooplankton um, have really been less studied than other groups of zooplankton. Um, although um, their taxonomy is uh, getting uh, worked on now extensively because of these uh, different phylogenetic groups, their ecology hasn't been as well studied and is less well integrated into limnology. Um, it's an active area of research right now. Um, one thing that's interesting is that a number of these um, microzooplankton, although not all of them, can live at relatively low oxygen concentration. So they're the type of uh, consumers that you might find in some of the hypolimnia of hypoxic lakes. And they can reproduce in several different ways if we think about their life history. Um, some reproduce sexually by conjugation. They'll exchange nuclei and genetic material. So again, here's sort of a, a little uh, paramecium conjugation image to spice up your day. And uh, some can reproduce asexually by fission, uh, so they don't have to reproduce sexually. 
And many forms, and this is going to be a sort of trait generally of a lot of these aquatic forms, can produce protective uh, resting stages or cysts. Um, in this case, many of these microzooplankton, many of these single-celled organisms, uh, can produce cysts that are protected uh, even when they're dried, when they're exposed to excessive heat or cold. Um, some have been found to be viable for well over 40 years. Um, they can rest in the sediments and then uh, regenerate populations later. And we'll mention this several times, and it's pretty interesting uh, for several reasons. Uh, first, because this is a way that they can escape from bad conditions in the water column, escape in time. Second, because there's the possibility then of looking in the sediment record for all of these organisms that make resting stages and going back in time as you go deeper in the sediments and hatching out organisms from previous times when the lake may have been in different conditions. And in the last part of the class when we talk a bit about paleolimnology and restoration, unlike say going back in time and you may not be able to reconstruct easily a kind of mammal that lived uh, in certain conditions before humans disturbed a system, you may actually be able to go back and hatch out uh, zooplankton or microzooplankton from the sediments that existed say before we polluted a lake and restore some of the genotypes from those times to a system. So the um, mastigopher or the flagellates are consuming generally small algae, things smaller than them, remember that basic rule of aquatic systems, as well as bacteria like we talked about in the microbial loop and some dead particles as well. And then the ciliates, um, the ciliophora and the amoeboid forms can also consume the flagellates. Um, and again, the cilia and the flagella aren't just used for locomotion. Um, they're also used to bring currents and food to the cell. And sometimes you'll even get ciliates eating each other, as shown here, uh, or you'll get uh, amoeboid forms and ciliates eating each other. Um, again, the amoeboid forms are going to use their pseudopodia to engulf food. And these protists themselves are going to be eaten by other zooplankton. So if they're eating algae, they're going to be um, primary consumers, and then they might be eaten by predatory zooplankton that would be secondary consumers. So here we're going to have a multicellular zooplankton we'll talk about shortly, a rotifer that's been ingested by a ciliate. So again, there's going to be an overlap in size, but some of these single-celled protists that we've just talked about as microzooplankton are going to be the same size as some of the smaller multicellular metazooplankton, uh, metazoan plankton. Um, and so there's this, again, size overlap in range between different types of organisms. So all of the zooplankton we're going to talk about subsequently are going to be in the kingdom, the anim kingdom animalia. So they're animals like us. They're multicellular. The ones we just talked about were single, single cellular. They're not going to be quite as dramatic as these uh, vertebrates. Uh, they're going to be invertebrate organisms that are living in the open water of lakes and, and uh, ponds and making a living there. So you may not think of freshwater systems as a place where you would find uh, jellyfish. And we don't have true jellyfish uh, from the group that's considered true jellyfish, but we have members of the same phylum, the phylum Cnidaria, that was formerly called Slenterata, um, that, uh, that are present in some lakes. They're not very common, but they are present. Some of you who've gone hiking in the Catskills or other areas may have come across a lake uh, that had these freshwater Craspidacusta that are found in scattered lakes throughout uh, much of the United States now, although it's thought that they've invaded uh, in the 1800s uh, from China. It's actually thought that during one of the World's Fairs they invaded uh, along with some plants in a display from China. Um, and these are freshwater small jellyfish. Um, they're not very large uh, in size, but they can become quite abundant in lakes. And they're not a danger to humans. You can swim in lakes where you see these blooms. Uh, they will, they, their stingers don't affect almost any people. Um, but they do, um, are able to eat other zooplankton, uh, crustaceans that we'll talk about next, and even some small fish, some larval fish. And these uh, forms are found irregularly in lakes because the form that is the medusa form, the jellyfish-like form, uh, as you guys learned in an intro bio class, has, uh, produces an egg that develops into a planula larvae, and that's going to develop into a benthic form. For the Craspidacusta, that benthic form that's living at the bottom of a lake is pretty inconspicuous and small. 
But the Craspa de Custa spends most of its life in that stage, um, and the Medusa form can be pretty short-lived. And so when conditions are right, you'll get Medusas formed, you'll have these freshwater jellyfish floating around the lake, um, and then often there'll be these small inconspicuous benthic polyps. And it may sound familiar to you that there are polyp stages, um, cnidarians in fresh waters, because we learned about hydra. Um, that is a slightly different organism. So we'll talk more about that in a second and not confuse those. Some of those really interesting East African lakes, uh, the rift lakes that had a lot of endemic species, species unique to the lake, um, like Lake Tanganyika, also have some endemic jellyfish that live in them. And so the medusas that are freshwater jellyfish, they have these polyp forms in their life cycle. But things like hydra that we talked about in the streams have a different life cycle where they do not have a medusa form. So they just exist as a polyp form. They can reproduce asexually or sexually, but they don't have a free swimming jellyfish stage. Uh, so don't think that a hydra that you'll see in the demo or that you learned about in the stream section is one part of the life cycle of uh, the medusas that are the freshwater jellyfish. Um, but do you realize that there is a benthic polyp stage that looks similar but more inconspicuous uh, to a hydra that exists for these freshwater jellyfish. And these jellyfish are considered plankton. You may say, hey, they're big and I can see them. Why are they plankton? And remember the definition of plankton. Plankton are things that can swim, um, but they are not able to swim effectively against a current. And so these are considered to be plankton because they can't swim against a strong current. Um, like all cnidarians, they're radially symmetrical. Um, and they catch their prey uh, through a series of specialized cells, especially these nematocysts or harpoon-like uh, structures that when triggered uh, by motion of the prey um, are able to uh, launch a harpoon into the prey um, and then that is able to penetrate uh, the, the uh, prey item and many of them have neurotoxins, some have sticky cells uh, and so they're able to capture, disable, and then consume their zooplankton or larval fish prey and eat it. We also don't always think of mollusks as being pelagic. You don't see a lot of freshwater uh, adult mollusks swimming around the open water. Um, however, so in the freshwater systems, the adult mollusks are benthic. There are a few uh, marine mollusks that are definitely open water species. But some of the bivalves that we talked about in the stream section and the bentho section have pelagic uh, larvae, planktonic larvae. Our native unionid or pearly mussels make a glochidium larvae um, that can be found for short periods of time in the plankton for some species. But the glochidia larvae are not free living. What they do is rapidly attach to fish. Um, and then they'll insist and uh, metamorphose into mussels and sink to the bottom. So I'll show you their life cycle. Many of these unionids um, require specific fish species for this glochidia larvae to attach to um, in order to develop. And so we have our nice little often endangered now pearly mollusks. Um, they'll fertilize each other and produce these young larvae. Um, and we'll talk about these guys again in the invasive species section because they've been so negatively impacted by the zebra and quagga mussels. Uh, but there's some amazing videos on the Freshwater Mollusk Conservation page that there's a link to in your Blackboard site of the mollusks actually luring and trapping the fish to inject the glochidia into their gills directly. But some species will release the glochidia Glochidia larvae into the water, those will then attach to the gills either way that they go, either directly or into the fresh into the water, onto the gills. These are gills of fish. These are the little tiny glochidia larvae. They clamp onto the gills. Um, and except in one study in a lab where they artificially put um, millions and millions of glochidia larvae into an individual fish, there have not been seen to be negative effects of these glochidia larvae on the on the gills of the native fish. And then they'll mature um, with the fish. The fish will disperse them elsewhere. The juveniles will come out of the fish gills and settle on the bottom and develop into adults again. 
that's a really different life cycle than the mollusks that we have that have really invaded the Northeast over the past 30 years, the zebra and quagga dracaenid mussels that again we'll talk more about in the invasive species section. And they produce larvae that live in the plankton for a week or two. And that's how they disperse. They don't disperse with the fish. They disperse by being little planktonic animals that are eating algae in the water. Um, and so the native mussels, the uniated mussels, are releasing lots of these small glochidia larvae that attach to fish, but the zebra mussels are releasing many, many more, huge numbers, millions and millions and millions of veligers that they can re produce repeatedly during the course of a year. And these little veliger larvae can live in the open water of the system for a week or two, be dispersed to many other places. That's part of how they've spread so well. And they're able to survive for longer in the plankton because they are able to eat algae and function as little zooplankton for this week or two of their life cycle. And in zooplankton toes, during times where there are lots of veligers being produced, you will find numerous veliger larvae um, in your samples. Um, so they're consuming algae, they're herbivores, um, and they're filtering other material. Uh, some of the tiny zooplankton as adults are eaten by the adults, and detritus and algae as well as adults. So let's go on to one of the three major groups of zooplankton in freshwaters. There are three really primary groups of zooplankton in freshwaters that are the most, most that comprise most of the zooplankton. These are the rotifers, the copepods, and the cladocerans. Copepods and cladocerans are types of crustaceans, um, and rotifers are in a different, so they're arthropods, and rotifers are a separate phylum. So we'll discuss these three major groups and a lot of the characteristics of, the, of them because this is going to comprise well over 90%, uh, often 100% of what you're going to find in most zooplankton toes. So first, the phylum rotifera. This is the first of our three major groups. There are two major classes, uh, the class deloid and the class monogonata. And the deloids are really interesting. Uh, deloid means leech-like. Um, and deloids, the different species in this group, all look basically the same. So these are multicellular organisms. They're very small. They'll have this corona that has a ciliary band right here. You can see in action that they're going to use in part for motion and in part to get fur. Uh, to get food. <laughs> and then they have, they're divided into a head region that you can see here, um, a neck region, a trunk region, and then they have this lower area and this foot. And they may be able to attach to surfaces depending on the species. And when food is brought in by these corona, then it gets ground up by these jaws or trophy. Here they are blown up. And there can be a diversity of forms of these jaws or trophy um, based on what they're eating. Um, even though there are about 200 species of these deloid rotifers, they are very difficult to tell apart morphologically. They all look very, very similar. And here's a picture of one, Rotaria. The other group uh, is the class monogonata. This type of rotifer uh, comprise most of the species, about 90% of the species of rotifer. Some of them may live in a hard case. This is a lorica a hard case for this caratella, and the little rotifer, you can see the corona here, is inside of this hard case. Why might it have a case? I know you guys all know that it might be to protect it from predators. Here's one that you can really see might be protective. The rotifers in this lorica, this calicadia, and it's got these really long spines here that might make it effectively a much larger prey item. And remember, Things in aquatic systems generally are only eaten by things that are bigger than them. So if you've got essentially these like giant toothpick projections sticking off of you, that makes it really hard to consume. It'd be like eating your hors d'oeuvre with the toothpick still in it. And some of them don't have cases. So here's a naked one. Um, you can see the little foot here. Here's the coronal band. You can see the trophy, the gut, all the organs. Many of these are really clear. You might think about why they're clear too. We've talked about that before. Here's another one, Sinkita, the foot, the corona. Real diversity of forms in these monogonata. So unlike the deloids, these look really different. The different groups look really different. Here's Testudinella. You guys can all guess why it got that name. Here's Brachionis. There are three of them here. These are carrying their eggs here. Here are the corona band. So the females are actually carrying their eggs along with them. 
Here's one that's attached by a foot to a piece of detritus, and here's the coronal band that's bringing food to it. Here's a colonial one. So conochylus has individual rotifers here. There's their, cor their corona, and they're attached to each other by their foot. It'd be like if a bunch of organisms had their feet connected to each other and were swimming around with their heads in the air. Um, and so this whole colony will swim around in the open water. Each one will eat. Why might they be colonial? What advantages, again, would, it be to be, would, it, would there be to be bigger in the water? You can think about that again. Here's a predatory rotifer, a splankna, with a small splankna inside of it. Here's its corona. These really, really, for all the world, look like sort of clear floating garbage bags floating around in the plankton in the open water. And they'll ingest other organisms and consume them. We'll be discussing them because they can change shape depending on what predators are present. So what are some general characteristics of the rotifers, this first major group of, of freshwater zooplankton? First, the smallest uh, known metazoan or multicellular animal uh, is one of the rotifers, Felinia, um, and that's only, uh, that should say 33 microns. The formatting must have been messed up. 33 millimeters would actually be pretty large, so 33 microns. Um, and, it, and they can also get to a giant size for some rotifers of one millimeter, like that Asplankna, uh, but that's still really small. So these rotifers are very small organisms. And morphologically, they're actually really diverse. Even though they're small, you can see that huge range of, of shapes and sizes. Some species are attached, but many, many are purely planktonic. Um, and they're most abundant in freshwater. Uh, they evolved and diversified in freshwater. They're fewer marine rotifers than freshwater rotifers. Some of them have these long spines and so forth for predation defense that we'll talk about again later in the class. Um, they can have this hard lorica case. Um, they also have a unique trait uh, called utility, where they have cell constancy. So um, after um, mat maturity, they have a constant number of cells. When they're growing, they do not uh, produce additional cells. They just grow in size. Uh, and this is the same as nematodes, uh, so they can be used for developmental biology research, just like people uh, do for, for uh, the nematodes. Uh, they have this unique feeding apparatus, the corona, that can also help them move. They have these unique jaws. The jaws are made of chitin, just like the skeleton of a lobster or other crustacean, the exoskeleton. And these are really pretty abundant. In most fresh waters in the summertime or the growing season, you will find uh, several hundred per liter. And there can be thousands per liter if they're really blooming. The deloids have an interesting fact in that they are purely asexual. That class of rotifers has, it does not have sexual reproduction. Um, and when people have done some genetic work to estimate when these guys uh, diverge from other groups, it seems that these species, some of them have been sec asexual for over 40 million years. And so this is really interesting to evolutionary biologists. Um, there are not that many purely asexual animal species, and many of them are thought to be young. Uh, and so it's a big question in the evolutionary realm as to what's the advantage of being sexual, because you actually spend energy making both males and females. And people have come up with a bunch of hypotheses that you guys learned about in evolution of, as to why sexuality might be a really important way to, say, have recombination and diversity of offspring. So the idea that you can have these asexual species persisting for long periods of time is really fascinating. So a lot of evolutionary biologists study rotifers for some of these region, reasons. Unlike the deloids, which are purely asexual, there's an interesting life state, life cycle for the monogonata, um, the monogonata rotifers. And generally what we have is a female um, that reproduces asexually, this amictic female that doesn't uh, ha do meiosis, doesn't produce, uh, produce um, doesn't reproduce sexually. And it produces a diploid egg that, repro that pr turns into a female. So rotifers, with this life stage for most of the year, are able to reproduce really quickly. Um, they can, each time they make an egg, it develops into a new female, the population explodes, and they can grow really, really quickly. The, the population can grow quickly. Then when conditions get bad, um, they are stimulated to produce females that are able to have meiosis, and those females produce haploid eggs. Um, they can develop then into males or into uh, eggs. Um, the males then make sperm that can fertilize those eggs. 
that fertilization results in a resting egg that's diploid again, and that resting egg can stay in the sediment um, or it can uh, just stay uh, in the water column, but generally stays in the sediment either for a year or for longer. And then when conditions are right, it will hatch and develop into a new female to start that life cycle again. So in these rotifers then, sexual reproduction is necessary to produce this resting stage that's going to be dormant in the sediments and uh, let the population uh, persist in the sediments even when it's not in the water column. They reproduce really quickly. Um, generally, when they're going through that asexual phase of their life cycle, it may just take a few days to at most a few weeks, depending on temperature and some other factors for each generation. Um, some species carry their eggs and release live young, so they're live young bearing, viviparous. Um, most lay only one egg at a time, and they carry it for one to three days um, until it hatches. Um, there are several known stimuli for the production of males and uh, sexual reproduction. One that's interesting is a diet shift, so even things like the nutrient content and the vitamin content of algae can stimulate some species to make males. Um, and in addition, crowding. And think about, like, why would crowding make males? It sort of makes sense in this case, right? Because if you have crowding, there might be food that's running out or uh, excretory products that are building up. And then it's a good time to not be in the water column. It would be advantageous if you could make resting stages then to survive those poor times and hatch again when there might be another algal bloom or temperatures were more uh, conducive to growth. Again, they use these cilia to create currents that are used to bring in food. Um, there's some links to films on the Blackboard site about that. Some are predatory, like the asplankna. Some eat algae. Some eat the microzooplankton that we talked about. And some will eat other rotifers or other small zooplankton. And the jaws, the trophy of these guys, um, that they use to grind or pierce their prey reflect their diet. Some that look more like hammers or malleate are used to mash food. So just like herbivores on land have uh, molars that are grinder, grinding and, and trying to digest that plant material, the algae are a little tougher than the animal prey. And so these uh, trophy are designed to grind the algal play, prey. Um, the vergate shape, uh, the pinching shape, is used to uh, puncture tissue and suck up the contents of the prey. And then these uh, forcipate uh, forms are able to actually extend out of the mouth and grab food and tend to be really common uh, in some of the predatory forms. So just like forceps coming out of the mouth and grabbing food from the prey. Here's some close-ups of some of these malleate forms. Vergate forms. The next major group of freshwater zooplankton are going to be in the phylum arthropoda. So remember the arthropods, uh, the exoskeleton, jointed legs, and so forth. Um, they're in the class Crustacea, which is a very uh, aquatic dominated class, in the order Branchiopoda um, or Lungfoot. And uh, the suborder here is going to be Cladocera. And our poster child for this group is the Daphnia or water flea. Here's its eye spot. Um, in here, it's got um, legs that it uses for swimming and for feeding with fine hairs, swimming legs here. A gut, you can see the green of the algae it's eaten. Here are some eggs in the brood sac here, and its exoskeleton here. And this is a side view. You're looking at the side, side view of this Daphnia. Here's some other forms of Daphnia. Some of them have these amazing little pointy heads we'll talk about later. Um, here's a smaller uh, Cladocerin, Bosmina. Looks almost like an elephant. I like to call it commonly the elephant flea. Here's its eye spot. Um, here's some even smaller ones, Chidorus. Again, you can see the eye spot. Here's the carapace. Here's a good view where you can see that looking at the side view, you might miss the idea that this carapace has a gap in it. This is the other side of the carapace, and all the legs are in there. So these cladocerans that are herbivores are going to feed by pulling current food in, grabbing it in its mouth. They're able to use these legs and generate a current um, through this gap in the carapace. Here's some more really nice images of some other cladocerans. So again, this general common body form eye spot that can detect light, this gut, these eggs that they're carrying, swimming appendages, feeding legs, carapace. 
And we have a few predatory cladocerans. Here's a native one in North America. This is Leptodora with a small eye spot. Really diaphanous, transparent. These are its arms. These are its grasping legs for capturing prey. This is its main part of its body. Um, and this is transparent. Why would it be transparent? Think about that more. We're going to be talking about that more. Who might eat it? We have another native predator, this polyphemus. It's got one giant eye, and the eye has these omatidia um, that are actually really good at focusing images. Um, and so this is like a one-eyed monster, as if uh, that little guy from Monster Incorporated was not a nice little creature, but a predatory organism. It's got one eye, swims around. Polyphemus uh, was the cyclops in Greek mythology, so think of a one-eyed organism. It's got these legs to grasp its prey. And it's actually just probably eaten another polyphemus or predatory organism because its gut is brown. Uh, some of its relatives like to eat eye, the eyes first of their prey, um, get all that pigment. Here are the eggs in its, in its brood sac. Um, and so this guy will eat other zooplankton. This is actually female, so th it's got eggs, right? So this female will eat other zooplankton. Um, and there have been, there's been work done that shows that polyphemus and some other of these predators actually are able to use these complex eyes to form images and, and hunt visually. So even these tiny organisms can do that. We have some exotics that have come into the, uh, the New York region in the Great Lakes and the Finger Lakes. We have this fishhook flea, Circopagus, which has an eye spot. It's a relative of polyphemus and a predatory cladocerin. Um, here's its little brood sac with a resting egg in it and this long, long tail spine with this hook on it. Um, this is Circopagus. And we've got a bigger one in the Great Lakes, Bithotrephes, here. Um, and this is a native Leptodora predatory cladocerin for a scale. And here are some larval, it's a larval fish, a larval uh, alewife for a scale. Um, and so these are really big and really spiny and really different than our native Leptodora. Uh, so when we get to the invasive section, we'll be talking about these guys. Think about how being really spiny might be advantageous for a zooplankton um, and what differences it might make in our lakes now to have these two spiny predators as cladocerins in addition to this guy, this, this uh, transparent, less spiny one. So what are some characteristics of this group as a whole? They're bigger than the rotifers. They're uh, about, again, 300 microns, not millimeters, to one centimeter. Um, they have a bivalve carapace with a gap. And here's showing that gap even better. We're looking sort of from the front side of the Daphne, and we can see these legs that have these filtering combs on them that are able to help remove Daphne from the water. So they have paddle-shaped legs. They draw water currents into the carapace. Um, they have one to two weeks per generation, um, so a little longer um, than the rotifers, but still a pretty short generation cycle. You can imagine populations would build up rapidly if it only took a week or two, depending on temperature and other conditions, for them to reproduce and have the next generation. So here's the life history of the Daphnia. Uh, we start with our female, and again, like the rotifers, through most of the summer, these females are able to reproduce asexually. And so the population of Daphnia and other, other cladocerans can build really rapidly through parthenogenesis. And then we call this facultative parthenogenesis because when conditions are poor again, um, a haploid egg is formed. Uh, and uh, this haploid egg, then uh, some of the females are able to make males that make haploid sperm. That haploid egg and sperm uh, join to make a resting egg, uh, which we call uh, an aphipia for some of these organisms. Aphipia means saddle, uh, and you'll see that. And this is a diploid resting egg in this case. Um, and so in this case, the males are, are diploid as well. The females are diploid. It's not an alteration of males being a haploid versus diploid. The males are also diploid. And then this aphipia can stay in the sediments for sometimes uh, quite a long time, almost 100 years, and then uh, hatch into a female and start the cycle again. Um, there are some species, especially in the Arctic, um, that have been shown to be able to produce resting eggs that are viable or, or can ha that can hatch um, without, having, uh, ase without having sexual reproduction, to produce these asexually without males. And you can think what's different about the Arctic that might select for females that are able to make resting eggs uh, without having this extra stage of making males. Um, and so maybe think about the growing season length uh, in those Arctic systems. 
So you can see why they call this an aphipia. If you were spoke Latin and you knew that that was a saddle, this looks like a saddle on the back of the Daphnia. And this aphipium holds two resting eggs, um, and it can float for a while and be blown around the lake and be carried on uh, duck's feet and the feathers of, of other waterfowl to other lakes. Then it can sink to the bottom um, and stay in the, in, in the sediments for some period of time, hatching the next year uh, or hatching after many years. Um, and so now that you know what this looks like, you may be able to see these aphipia blowing to the side of a, a lake or pond at some point in the future. So Cladocera have direct development, um, just like the rotifers. The offspring that are hatched look just like the adults. There's not a distinctive uh, metamorphosis or change in form associated with growth in each instar. And the clutch size can be really variable. You might have a female that has many eggs, like this one, or one that has few eggs. They're going to carry uh, the eggs in the brood sac until they develop. You can see the eye spots of the offspring and release them live, generally. Um, and that clutch size, or the number of offspring, is related to the age of the female. The bigger the female, the more eggs can be held, and generally the more offspring are produced. Um, and that's related to how many molts they've gone through as they keep molting. As they get older, they get bigger, they produce more uh, offspring, and they produce more offspring when there's more food available. So after each molt as adults, um, they're going to produce eggs and release them. So they produce, often produce, if they live long enough, they'll produce several, and aren't eaten by a fish or something, they'll produce several generations. There are some cues for that production of, of males and haploid eggs, and these include crowding again. Um, even the excretory products from a culture can sometimes generate that. Also reduced food conditions, reduced light, reduced temperature. So you can imagine what season that's mimicking. That's mimicking a fall or onset of winter condition can stimulate egg production. Um, again, most of them are herbivores, but some, like the Leptodora, the Polyphemus, and our little predators from elsewhere in the world, Bithotrephes and Circopagus, are, pred are predaceous. This is actually a Bithotrephes we hatched um, that has, uh, is eating a Daphnia. You can see the green gut of the Daphnia, so they can even eat each other. Um, and some of them are able to eat not just algae, but able to eat larger bacteria. Um, so some of these cladocerans can be important conduits of, of uh, organisms from the microbial loop uh, to the grazing food chain. Many of these are food for fish. Our third major group of freshwater zooplankton is the copepods. And again, these are arthropods, just like the cladocera. They're in the class Crustacea, which is the same again. And they're in their own order, Copepida. And um, these are, uh, there are two different suborders we're going to discuss primarily. Uh, there are several others, uh, one we'll mention. Um, and these are going to be uh, first the cyclopoids or suborder Cyclopoida. Um, and you can generally tell these from the other groups we'll discuss because they have short antennae. They tend to have an eye spot. We're looking at a dorsal view here, the legs are on the other side. Um, these are sort of tiny, almost shrimp-like organisms. Here they are with a bunch of algae. And we have calanoids it's from the suborder Calanoida. These have longer antennae, slightly different body shape. And you also may have heard of the suborder, har suborder Harpacticoid. Um, here they, here's a side view of this. So we've looked at a dorsal view before. The dorsal view will be looking down this way. Here you can see all of those legs that are extended. This guy is actually attached. Mo many of the harpacticoids are uh, living attached to substrates. That's part of why we're not going to talk about them as much in this zooplankton section. Uh, and some of them are also parasitic. So copepods are widely distributed in all freshwaters as well as in the oceans. Uh, in fact, uh, copepods are uh, the main herbivores on our planet. They're the main consumers of algae. There are more uh, copepods than there are any other herbivore on the planet. And in freshwaters, we see them uh, from the tropics up to Arctic regions, from low, um, really dilute, low ionic strength water to very salty water. Um, and they have interesting characteristics. They'll become fatty and accumulate different lipids if they're in cold environments. That might, uh, those lipids can be transferred to fish when fish eat them. And again, they have a body size that's a little bigger than some of these others from 300 microns, that should be a, a micron, uh, to five millimeters. Um, there's a, 
these guys are different from the other groups we talked about so far in that they can only reproduce sexually. They can't reproduce asexually. So you can guess maybe that's going to make their life cycle a little longer. Um, so they're distinct male and female copepods. And they also are different in that they have indirect development. So the juvenile that hatches from the egg is going to look different than the adult. And in this case, the juvenile is anopleus, uh, so anoplier larvae here. These are its legs. Um, and it's going to metamorphose, uh, it's going to molt several times, become a copepidid, um, an immature form, and then molt several times and become an adult. Um, and so they're going to mature from this stage to this other stage. And so in this case, we have larvae that look different um, and are sometimes going to behave different and eat different food than the adults. So let's talk a bit first about the cyclopoids. Um, generally, for cyclopoid copepods, females carry eggs in clusters, sort of like these little grape clusters, in egg sacs on their body. And they have 12 stages after the egg, uh, six noplier molts. And there's a lot of pretty complicated behavior of copepods, these little crustaceans, just like their larger relatives, you know, lobsters and crayfish. They have a lot of really interesting behavior. The males make packages of non-flagellated sperm called spermatophores, and they give them to the females. And there's a really nice video link there that will show you some mating, mating behavior where the uh, males can track the pheromones of the females and do a little mating dance. Um, the males have a bent antennae that's used to place the um, spermatophore in the female. So here we have a little bit of a crustacean uh, activity going on here. And so here we can tell females that don't have the bent antennae from the males that have these bent antennae to help them deposit that sperm package. So c compared to, to calanoids, they have a relatively, the cyclopoids have a relatively short uh, generation time, but it's longer than the generation time of the rotifers or the cladocerans. Um, they have several, often several, depending on whether they're in the tropics or the Arctic, often several generations a year, taking one to two months each, um, and that time is strongly affected by the temperature and where they're located. And these make resting stages, but a little different than the others. They don't have specific resting eggs. So in some species, the eggs can be dried and then hatch when, re when wet, the regular eggs, not a specific egg. Um, some of them will diapause or sort of go dormant in the sediments in the copepidid four stage, in the fourth molt of, of that immature copepidid stage. They don't make a specific diapausing or resting egg. And then they'll come out and molt from that copepidite four uh, due to changes, increases in temperature, increases of light in the spring. So this is an over overwintering, generally, survival, survival mechanism. Um, although the, the regular eggs can often really be hatched, and uh, cyclopoids actually disperse really well uh, from, say, pond to pond, despite there being no specific resting egg. So they do pretty well uh, at moving around and so forth, even without those specific forms. Here's eggs being carried by this cyclopoid. So calanoids, on the other hand, generally only have one or two generations per year. So they're, they're much longer lived. And m many of them carry eggs in a sack, but some of them will also broadcast their eggs into the water. Um, they do not diapause as this copepidite or immature form, uh, but they'll make a diapausing egg. And the male has one bent antennae to transfer the spermatophore instead of two. So here's a nice red pigmented calanoid copepod. It's the bent antennae of the male. You can see that up close. This is a little algae next to it. Um, and so these guys produce morphologically distinct um, diapausing or resting eggs. Um, the normal eggs that the calanoids will produce that if they're going to just hatch right into noplii are going to have a really thin shell and then the noplii will start growing and molting as a function of temperature. Uh, but the resting eggs have a thicker shell, takes more energy to make it. They can really withstand desiccation. They've been hatched after hundreds of years out of the sediment. Um, and one type from some of the Arctic populations is especially robust and can be uh, frozen. It has a two-layer uh, uh, skin or integument. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you have also some of these durable eggs in other conditions. Um, and the cues for hatching, again, are related to sort of onset of spring conditions, temperature, increased temperature, and increased light. For the cyclopoids, most of them are predatory or omnivorous. They may eat algae and other zooplankton. Um, the noplii, those juveniles, for 
even though the adults are generally predaceous or include animals in their diet, the noplii are generally herbivorous. Um, and then there's this ontogenetic or developmental shift in their diet from herbivory when the noplii are eating algae, so eating primary producers to predation where the adults are say eating microzooplankton uh, or other smaller uh, uh, zooplankton like some of the small cladocerans and then they'll metamorphose into these pre the predatory adults. They don't have a lot of elaborate leg modica modifications or other modifications for feeding. They grasp their prey. And again, the noplii are pretty small. So this is a rotifer in a lorica next to the noplii or prey. And then they get larger as they mature. The calanoids set up feeding currents um, and they can remove uh, particles and select their food. And many of them are herbivorous. Um, although there are a few larger calanoid copepods that are predatory. Um, and again, those that are predatory sometimes have noplii that are herbivorous. And some of these have modified mouth parts uh, to help them uh, remove algae from the water. The harpactacoids um, generally are morphologically different, especially if they're living in sediments. They may be a little more streamlined, uh, uh, able to avoid crushing. They have smaller antennae. And their mouth parts are adapted to being able to uh, scrape particles from the sediments and from vegetation. And again, those of you who are fish keepers who might think of copepods as parasitic, uh, that's not our calanoids or cyclopoids. That's more uh, these harpactacoid copepods and some other groups. Um, so how are they finding their foods? They actually have pretty complicated behaviors. On these antennae here, they have mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors, so almost like taste buds. And the algal cells, as we've discussed, are a bit leaky, and they'll have some materials that are uh, removed, that are coming off of them and diffusing into the water and being swirled around by the turbulence. And the copepods can distinguish those, go to algal uh, blooms, they can grab organisms, and they've been found to be very discerning. We'll mention this before. They can choose types of algae. They're able to select particular algae that they would find more edible or choose for a particular reason. So they're very selective feeders using these mechanical and, and chemical detectors that they have. Now we're going to get into a few more minor groups of zooplankton, uh, just to, uh, to wrap things up. Things that you'll see around here quite a bit, um, or that are important for other reasons were discussed in other parts of the class. So the first we're going to talk about are some mycids, um, or these, these little opossum shrimp. Um, and these can be a centimeter or two, um, and they're very long-lived relative to these other groups we've talked about. These are arthropods and crustaceans. They're in the order Malacostrica. Um, and around here, they're what we call glacial relics. We find them in the, cold, the deep Finger Lakes and the deep Great Lakes in the cold water. They were abundant in the glacial lakes after the last glaciation that covered our region. Um, and now they're found in these uh, remnant populations in the cold deep lakes and they prefer the cold water of these lakes. And they're really omnivorous. In some lakes they'll be eating uh, like diatom blooms that die and sink to the bottom of the lake. In some lakes they'll uh, be capturing daphnia and other organisms out of the water. Uh, they can shift their diet quite readily. Um, and Mysis relicta was the former name of these. It's uh, been renamed, but we'll go with, with this. It's, uh, it's just recently renamed. And we see this natural distribution in the deeper of the Great Lakes. They've been actually introduced into some other lakes. We'll talk about some of the consequences of an introduction into uh, Flathead Lake out in Montana, later in the invasive section. And we were all covered with ice around the Great Lakes here. And then you might remember we talked about how there was this glacial lake that formed, uh, formed here. Then the dams burst, and we got our sort of modern current existing forms of the lakes. So we have this glacial lake as the ice retreats, and now we have our current forms. And they're left in these cold water systems here, the Finger Lakes that are deeper and have cold water, and the Great Lakes that are deeper. There really aren't any in the shallow Lake Erie there, despite that picture. Also in the uh, class Crustacea are some uh, amphipods, um, which we mentioned in the stream section. Uh, they are not only benthic, they can also come up into the plankton, so they can be meroplankton. Uh, you find them more often near shore. Um, they'll eat not only the attached algae and dead animals, they can occasionally be predators. They can be long-lived. Both uh, mysis and amphipods can live for several years. Um, so you might find them in your plankton toes. 
Then in some of our uh, fishless lakes, um, we get fairy shrimp. Um, and fairy shrimp are really interesting. So in small ponds, in some of the vernal pools in the region, uh, you might find uh, some, some fairy shrimp in Astrica. And in some regions, there also are tadpole shrimp, Natastrica. And these guys are in the fishless ponds. You can think why that might be. They're pretty big, they're pretty visible. They're also pretty slow. Um, I've caught some with my bare hands out of ponds, uh, so that doesn't bode well for being able to escape from a fish. Um, they eat algae, bacteria, protozoans, some of our other zooplankton like rotifers. And the detrastica will also eat dead animals, and they can sometimes be predaceous, but they're only in those fishless ponds, so like little pools around here. Here's our natrastic, natrastrica. They can be um, scavengers or predators. And then we're going to just mention ostracods, which are also mostly benthic, um, but they also can come into the water column a bit, not as much as in oceans. Um, and they're going to be important because when we talk about reconstructing lake history from sediments, um, the carapace of these ostracods are going to be able to survive in the water, and different ostracods have different conditions that they favor, so it can help us reconstruct the conditions when they were alive. So they're mostly benthic. They may be miraplankton and have uh, make migrations into the open water. They're eating algae on the bottom sort of like the cows of the sediment zone. Uh, they produce uh, resting eggs, um, and they have both sexual and, and asexual reproductive cycles, uh, similar to some of our cladocera. Then there are a couple of insect larvae um, that we find locally. Um, Chaeobarus, or the phantom midge larvae, uh, there once was a student who came as the phantom midge for Halloween, because it's an awesome name. This is the phantom midge larvae. Its adult is a terrestrial insect. It's got an eye spot and these amazing uh, nasty mouth parts that we'll mention again, because these can be really big predators of Daphnia in ponds and in some lakes. Um, and they'll hide at the sediments in the day, come up into the water column at night. They float with these little bladders. They're sit and wait predators, a lot like an invertebrate version of a pike. So they'll hang out sitting there, they detect the motion of their prey, and they slam these mouth parts through their prey like a little unsuspecting Daphnia and consume them. And uh, there's another uh, relative that's a little bigger than that, Maclonix, that's found uh, pretty much in uh, fishless small vernal pools around here as well. So. That's our sort of journey through the zooplankton. Uh, hopefully you can see that zooplankton are really diverse. They're diverse in their body form. They're diverse in the phylogenetic origin. They may be single-celled organisms or multi-celled organisms. They can be herbivores. They can be predators. They may prefer to move from the bottom into the plankton, or they may spend their whole life cycle on the plankton. They can have direct development or indirect development. They can have short or fast life cycles. And so as we put all this together into zooplankton ecology and plankton uh, pelagic ecology in lakes themselves, we'll be able to connect all of these differences in zooplankton and differences in phytoplankton to make some inferences about our pelagic or open water food web. So hopefully you've been captivated a bit by the diversity of zooplankton. Um, and it was nice talking to you today. We'll see you next time.